thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Emma. And thanks to the team at LSV. Once again, I feel like a bit of a, uh, I feel like I live here. It's uh, been here a fair few times of late, but it's been really amazing because it uh, just shows the importance that uh, Lifestone Victoria is putting on the, um, the health and safety of their, of their members and people that are involved. So much appreciated once again. I also feel as safe as possible because I know every person in this room knows first aid. Is that correct? <laughs> Perfect, so if I go down, line up from mouth to mouth. So anyway, I'm married, so just take it easy. Um, no, much appreciated. So it's an opportunity for me to talk um, about what we do at Love Me, Love You, um, share my story, and, and, and the reason why we share, why I share my story so much um, is to help you connect to what your journey could look like. The connection of um, understanding through our awareness of who we are and what we are and what we're doing and what makes us tick um, in our everyday is, is really, really important. So we're going to go through some, some activities and exercises today so it's not just be sitting there and having a lovely breakfast with a beautiful view that is always at the views um, here. So much appreciated for that. But, and thanks for the housekeeping. If someone's phone does go off, there's a $100 donation to the foundation. <laughs> And I'm not one of those heads that you want to argue with either. So much appreciated. So we're all good. Okay. Um, uh, also, at any stage of today, um, you feel like you need to take some time out, just you know, slowly, just uh, make your way to the back, and um, we will sort of have a couple of couple of minutes for you and uh, take you some time out, and then wait, make your way back in and, and enjoy the activities again. So, um, as I said, there's going to be some activities. You're going to get up and about at one stage. Um, so. <coughs> Appreciate that, um, but as I said, um, hopefully that you get a bit out of this morning and thanks very much for your attention. Once again, also actually give yourselves a round of applause for actually turning up. So please, thanks very much. We do, we do know that time, we all have excuses. We all have an excuse not to be here this morning. Um, whether it be something happening at home, stress-related work, something that's happening, you will have an excuse not to be here, but for you to actually turn up is the greatest step that you'll take in your day, and hopefully, as I said, you'll get something out of today to carry forward back into your little network and your community and your life that you're living. But my story um, is called The Three Inches From Death and The Three Steps To Living, uh, and that, and that some, for some people, is quite confronting. Not quite confronting, really confronting to actually talk about death to talk about suicide, to talk about mental illness, to talk about the shit that we actually go through in our life. But hopefully, as I said today, we're going to connect you to my story and then actually ask you what your story is. How do you connect to your journey? And then give you some, some tools and act, um, information and resource to take away from here. But it all started here. My story really starts here, but it nearly finished here. On October 28, 2011, I found myself on a roof very similar to this, with the idea of actually jumping off. This is a roof that many of you probably live under. Hopefully you all live under. It was a roof that I found myself, after having lived with mental illness for, 17, for about 17 years of my life, and being a drug addict for six years of my life, contemplating the idea that I was not worthy of this world anymore. And this is a familiar story that a lot of people are telling these days, or aren't able to tell anymore. Writing their final chapter for a lot of people is more connected to our community than we'd like to believe. Suicide, the idea of suicide is really confronting because it is the fact that people feel that worthlessness of what they are, deserve to be here. And hopefully, as I said, for you to understand, to have these conversations and normalise the behaviours around seeking help and understanding what the hardships and challenges that we might be going through, but understand the safe environment that we are all actually a part of. For me, after having lived with mental illness and being a drug addict for so long, I did find myself on this roof and it was my nearly my final chapter. But I like to believe it was actually the start of my new book. Because this is the day that actually made me realise that I was, worth, I was worthy of this world. The challenges that I'd been through from high school, primary school, as a young fella, was quite challenging. I did play AFL for eight years. I looked like I could, my head could bust through a brick wall. Not meant to laugh, <laughs> but thanks. And what that does is it just automatically understands for me to share this story and for many people that are out there sharing their stories is it just breaking down the stigma that's associated with mental illness and suicide. 
An idea of that is because people think that people of level or calibre or that perform will never actually go through the challenges or hardship in their life. But as Emma just noted, Glenn Maxwell yesterday has thought the fact that he needed to take some time to look after his mental health. Only on the weekend or just start of the week did he score 60 runs off 20 balls in a 2020 match. So no one ever thought something could be wrong. But we all go through these challenges, we all understand that we all go through some, some battles and we're all fighting a battle that nobody knows about. But how do we actually create those conversations to understand that we can actually have these conversations with the people around us and make sure that we're going to have our tomorrow? But as I said, that's my story where it nearly started. But the World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being where every individual realizes his or her own potential and can cope with the normal stresses of life. Stop there. Cope with the normal stresses of life. People are actually scared of stress. People are afraid of what stress can do to them. But allowing ourselves to, in the interpretation of stress is that stress allows us to grow if we overcome the challenge of it. And then we can cope with those normal stresses of life. I'll explain to you how your brain works and actually de deals with stress. Up here, the big brain, big head. This is our filter down here, what I like to call my security guard those people that can see it, okay? How your brain works is that all your senses, all your experiences, they all come through the middle, right in here. You all see it, you all feel it, you all do it. We have thousands and thousands of experiences every single day, some good, some not so good. And what happens with your brain in terms of your filter, by laying the foundations of your self-care and understanding through here to make sure that those experiences are coming through nicely, the experiences come in and likely, hopefully, because we laid the foundation for our self-care and interpreting those and processing those experiences. It's a smooth process. Comes in, comes back through. We learn from it, we filter it, we work it through nicely. By clogging up your filter and not having a good interpretation of what stress and these experiences are, <coughs> what happens is your brain and your filter comes through and instead of going smoothly, it starts going a bit zigzag takes a lot more energy and a lot more pressure, a lot more effort to deal with. Goes through, same thing. Keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. What happens is if we don't take the care for ourselves and lay those foundations, that keeps clogging up. And instead of making that smooth process that we like, which makes our mental health, instead it comes out and clogs it right up. And what happens if we don't clean our filter? What happens to our brain? What happens up here? Anybody? Pardon? Yeah? What else? You pop. You do, you pop. Which creates a chemical imbalances in our body, in our brain, which makes it people being diagnosed with the mental health challenges or mental illness. But how do we process that? How do we clean our filter? How do you clean your filter? What's the easiest, most simple way that people are afraid of doing? Talk, 100%. Let it out. Process it out. Because if I keep filtering it up here, it's gonna pop. But how you actually filter that and clean that filter is actually allowing it to come out. Allowing us to appreciate and be aware of the fact that I need to talk about it. And how do you talk about it? And we keep this big thing around in the media and all these campaigns, everyone goes, talk, talk, talk. But then what do we do with it? How do we process that information? That is, and that is what are we trying to do at Love Me, Love You and all the other organisations and mental health system, is help you understand how you process that information. Because we can talk all day. On note, females talk 60, 000, on average 60,000 words a day. You're like, yeah. A male, on average, 10,000 words. So there is this big thing, a big push for men to talk more, talk more, let's get it out, let's get it out. But don't push a man 
into doing something that he's not comfortable with. He needs to be comfortable with the fact that, and as I said, being able to talk about it, especially being able to process what that information is being relayed so that we can cope with those normal stresses of life. Okay? So that we can work productively and fruitfully and, is ab and are able to make a contribution to our community. Okay, that's what life's about. Being able to make a contribution to your community, whether it be here, at your workplace, at home, at your sports club, at your drama club, mu music club, wherever you are. How do you con contribute to your community? And that's what we're about, that's what life's about. The more contribution you make to your community, the actually more you get back. So you've got to be able to make sure that you're processing it to make sure that you can have your every day and you are positively contributing to your community. Okay? Let's be buzzer. But in 2019, as Emma noted, one in two people in this room will be affected by a diagnosed mental illness in their lifetime. Will be impacted. That's scary. It is. Diagnosed. That's the, the, the word. But more like 100% of us are going to go through some mental health challenges because that's what life's about. Because society today is throwing up so many more curveballs at us than we'd like to believe. And those curveballs aren't allowing us to cope with those normal stresses of life. Because our interpretation of those normal stresses of life have become curveballs as opposed to slow balls that we can smack out of the park every day. There's 180 on average attempts of suicide every single day. So over 65,000 plus attempts of suicide in Australia every year. And eight of those are successful every day on average. In the, recent, in the last year, in the last four or five years, it's been on average over 3,000 suicides every single year. And six of those are male every day, six of the eight. But three quarters of those suicide attempts are female. So this is not a male issue, this is not a female issue, this is our issue. This is society's issue. This is society's challenge. Globally, a person dies from suicide every 40 seconds. There's over 800,000 suicides in the world every year. And a lot of it's come down to the fact that we are so disconnected from what we are. Because technology, as much as it's brought us together, it's actually driving us apart. Because we've forgotten how to build relationships and actually deal with each other, how to actually listen to a conversation, how to read body language, how to read verbal language, how to reach out and have this personal connection between two people. Because isolation and loneliness is becoming the number one cause or impact for mental illness and for suicide. Because mental health, as we state, is actually the connection, the energy between two people. Our health is the connection between two people. This space in here, the more we can invest that time and effort to be with each other and around each other in an authentic and genuine way, the better off we're going to be as a society. So we can contribute to our community. But this is my story. You see up here, the hopes and dreams of a kid. I don't know if you saw that, see that photo, it's pretty hard with this light. But I have my blonde bouffant playing basketball, sitting next to my dad, sitting there with my knee pads. Anyone played basketball when they were younger? Yeah, do you wear knee pads? No. <laughs> no. Yeah, mum and dad thought that'd be a great idea. Anyway, but I put this photo up because this man next to me is my dad. My dad, I believe, is a superhero. We all believe our role models are superheroes, that's why they're our role models. My dad played soccer for Australia, my dad was the most hardest working man I've ever met in my life. But my old man, my dad, Joe, also was living with undiagnosed bipolar through my childhood, which caused our relationship, the relationship with my mum, my sister and my brother, to become quite a turbulent one. And the roller coaster that was living with my old man. And as a kid, you just want to be loved. Yeah? You just want to be enjoyed, you want to be acknowledged, you want to feel like you belong. The relationship that I had with my dad become quite 
emotionally abusive in a way. Not through mean, not through malice, just because of the fact that he was not understanding of what was actually happening inside his head. So I'm now a 39 year old husband and father of two. My relationship with my old man is as good as it could possibly ever be. Due to the fact that he finally seeked help. And this is the biggest thing, he finally seeked help. But it took for him to crash. <coughs> this is a male, historically, the way we do it. We wait for us to crash before we ask for help. So him dealing with that obviously caused a range of issues for me. And I was always looking for something, I was always seeking something to fill that hole in my life. Which created a whole range of experiences for me that weren't so positive at primary school, at high school, through my AFL career. Not until about seven, eight years ago that I actually finally had this conversation with my dad to say, what's going on? The realisation that I needed to actually ask for help as well. Sorry, there's a fly, it's getting me. <laughs> but if I was able to give myself some lessons, it's about taking responsibility for your feelings, because we always are really quick to pass the buck. Someone else caused it for me. Maybe. But if I take, take responsibility for my feelings and how I'm gonna go about it, who's gonna do it for me? Who's gonna do it for you? So about to take responsibility for your feelings. How do you regulate those emotions and allow yourself to make sure that you're in control to move forward? It's also to show gratitude. Be grateful for the fact that we are able to be living. We are to be alive. We have a hot roof over our head, hot meal every day, shower, clothes, opportunity to engage in a workplace, in a community. But for me as a kid, I wasn't so grateful for the fact that my parents worked their bum off to actually create opportunities for my sister, my brother and I. So we've been able to show gratitude and the, the practice of gratitude, research shows by showing the respect that an opportunity deserves, what makes me different? What's your point of difference in this life? And be able to embrace that. And once you've embraced it, you've got to own it. The goods, the bads, and everything in between. If you don't own it, you become the victim. You become the victim, you go behind. So we, by sharing that difference and understanding how you embrace it to own it, allows us to become the victor every day. And by you leading the way in your life, people around you will see that as well. And your actions speak louder than words. So I can talk about this all day. But it's how you actually do it. So, and the biggest thing for me, and I've learned and the most proudest moment that I've ever had was when people that I used to party with and I were in the same boat as me, I'd seen the fact that I went clean. I asked for help. And years later, they came to me and just said, because you did it, I did it. So you've got to lead the way, take responsibility and own it. But growing up, Sport was my thing. Like many people in this room, sport is your thing. The, the, the feeling of sport, the physical activity and what it does for us and in terms of the chemicals that it releases. But it's actually about being a part of a community, about being a part of a club. <coughs> we all have different abilities and capabilities, different way that we do it and how we actually perform. But how we actually feel like we belong into a club is what it's about. But because I was a performer, I, you know, I was a scholarship at Essendon Grammar, so I was quite good at my sport, I played basketball, athletics, football became my thing. And footy, footy was actually really became my thing because I was actually able to physically hurt people and take out my anxiety onto other people. But it was the only place that I felt I belonged and felt safe. So my, away from footy, my performance wasn't there. When I was on that footy field, my performance was there because I felt safe. I felt like I belonged. And then we see in all these people that perform of a level is that we think, oh, nothing could be wrong. They're performing, what's up? But they're only performing because they actually feel safe. When we feel safest, and you know in your workplace, 
that when you feel safe in your workplace, you perform. When you feel safe and supported in your social network, you perform. So for me playing footy, no one ever thought anything could be wrong until I got drafted to Adelaide. Anyone been to Adelaide? Yeah, terrible place. <laughs> Gets me every time, then. But I got drafted to Adelaide Crows, I was 17 years of age, and I got drafted to Adelaide Crows and thought this was the dream. This is the dream that I thought about from when I was about 12 years old. <coughs> but being in Adelaide actually took away my physical support of my family, my reason why. We all have our reasons why, why we do everything in our life. My reason why is family. My connection to family is what makes me get through blood and non-blood. Being in Adelaide was really, yeah, my footy career was really symbolic around what mental health journey can look like. Because in Adelaide, it went down. It was not flourishing <coughs> one bit. I started doing all the wrong things. Alcohol then became my best friend. I never touched a drink of alcohol before I went to Adelaide. But alcohol became my best friend, so much to the point that I was passing out on park benches in the middle of Adelaide. Not the place you want to be. <laughs> but I never asked for help. And this was 20 years ago. So the conversations around asking for help, or the idea of even asking for help or support to understand the challenges that we go through, weren't had. Then I got traded back to Hawthorne Footy Club. I spent five years there and my life went up again. Because back to my family, back to my reason why, back to living in Melbourne, even better. Back to my connection of who I was and the reason why I was actually who I was. So I was putting all the right things in place. I was doing all the right things. As I said, my mental health started flourishing again. started performing again. But then I lost my grandfather when I was about 23, 24 at that stage. And not dealing with that grief and understanding what that was about, I fell back into my ways. Started drinking again. And that cost me my career at Hawthorne. So I'm the reason why they're actually the most successful club in the last 10 years. So for those Hawk supporters, you can thank me later. It's because I left. But then I went to North Melbourne. Anyone a North Melbourne supporter? Yeah? Good work. Good on you. Get an extra wristband. You need it. But I went to North Melbourne, and my year in North Melbourne was quite um, said, 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 symbolic around my mental health journey. It just started going down. Started taking pills and speed from my last year at North Melbourne. Doing all the wrong things, the self-destructive behaviours. It was, cost me my career at North Melbourne. Cost me my career at AFL, my dream. For the next six years, I became a drug addict. A performing, high-functioning drug addict. I was a personal trainer in the city. I was training myself 10, 12 times a week. I was a physical beast. I was training other people. I was doing 60 to 70 sessions a week. But I was having pipes for breakfast. That was my life until 2011. <coughs> I'd nearly lost my leg. So I dislocated my kneecap off the bone and had my kneecap halfway up my leg, put it back together. Awesome story. But then the infection come through that and I actually was travelling towards my heart and they didn't control that, I was going to die. So they're nearly going to have to amputate. Put it all back together, perfectly fine. That sent me on a big binge like I'd never seen before. Which brought me to that position where I was on 2011, Friday, October 28th, the idea of ending my life. Because I was embarrassed, I was ashamed, I was tired. I was tired with living inside my own head because I wasn't able to clean my filter, process that out. That's my story. But now my story, that's only a small part of it. I thought the idea would be great that I um, would launch the foundation and start this, this organisation to help people understand what their journey looks like, provide tools and resources and programs and events and campaigns to make sure that we we're all able to contribute to our community. And we did that. We became an organisation in 2013, 14 months after I nearly suicided. 
a year later, we launched the foundation with a walk from Sydney to Melbourne. Anyone driven to Sydney? Yeah, it's a bloody long way. Yeah, it's two and a half years exactly to the day after I nearly suicided. We launched a foundation with this walk. So 18 days of walking 50 to 70 kilometres a day. <coughs> the idea of just bringing some awareness and connecting people to the cause. And we did, we launched a foundation and now as an organisation we deliver face-to-face -face experiences and programs and events to thousands and thousands of people every year. So don't let anybody tell you you can't do it. But appreciate the fact of what your story looks like so you can make sure that you work forward to become the victor, not the victim. That's my story. And as I said, my connection to family is what I believe stopped me. You've got to find out what your connection is. What's your reason to move forward? What's your reason why? And who wants to own it? So for a couple of minutes, I'm actually going to get you to pull your phones out. And I want you to write down your story. Write down your story in your, phone, in your notes. Keep your phone out if you've got your phone. You can be detailed or as non-detailed as you like. I'd like you to write your story. <coughs> interesting. So write down. Goods, bads, indifference. Positive experiences, not so positive experiences. <coughs> okay. Now, give me time to finish it up. I would like you to pass your phone to the person next to you. Beautiful. Here we go. All good? Who felt a bit like, ooh, I don't want to pass that on? <laughs> okay. That very idea, that very idea of, and we all did it, and the first time I ever did that, it was like, whoa, nobody needs to know that. But this is why I talk about owning your story owning your journey. Don't be afraid of your shit. By allowing us to actually have the other person read it, <coughs> it's a big step. It's quite powerful. It's quite liberating. Who wants to stand up and read their story out? Who here? Go, Shane. Let's go. Is it, uh, oh, the mic. So um, I just did a quick summary of my time. But I said uh, I grew up on a dairy farm. I didn't like school or what I thought life was at the time. Uh, so I left school pretty early and went to work. Uh, moved out when I was 16. I moved to Melbourne when I was 18 from the country. Uh, did a lot of drinking and partying, making friends, having fun. After years, I found a meaningful relationship and had many career changes. Um, from uh, after some. Darker times, I found yoga and meditation, which changed my life. I uh, followed some new career paths uh, that were more rewarding and became more aware that the people around me are more important than money and see value of certain things. Well done. Good, Shane. There you go. Quite courageous to stand up. Because so, you know, actually speaking in front of people is the number one fear in people's lives. Yeah? So for a person with anxiety and depression, to choose this as a career was the stupidest choice I've ever made. <laughs> but here I am. But thanks, Shane. So it's about you owning it, okay? It's about you sharing the story and understanding the challenges that we go through, but understanding how, what we're going to do for it. By us connecting and sharing our own stories to the people around us, as I said, might open up their eyes. Might open up, might open up their opportunities. Create their connection so people feel safe enough and supported enough that they're not alone. And you'll see this on your wristbands. 
the idea of the wristbands is that you wear one and you actually give someone give one to somebody in your life that might need a little bit of love. It's pretty powerful because I had a guy that actually I used to live um, only yesterday. <coughs> we used to live in the same court with as a, as a little kid. He messaged me on, uh, on on Facebook and just said, "He goes, my apprentice is wearing your wristband today." My apprentice came to me a couple of weeks ago and said that he tried to suicide. But felt the connection because of the simple little wristband that he had. So he didn't go through with it. So this guy actually reached out to me, as I said, 20 years after I've last seen him, and said, simple gesture like that made all the difference. So it's your way of, you can contribute a little bit if you like. But, so we talk about the three steps to living, awareness, acknowledgement, and action. Okay, this is where we're gonna get into some little bit of activity. Okay. <coughs> awareness is about understanding, finding your meaning, how do you self-regulate, how do you regulate the emotions, the feelings, the experiences, okay, so you can clean your filter. How do you make it work? It's finding your purpose. Understanding we're all different people, we've all different personality traits, so our wiring predisposes us to different challenges and experiences. Same two people standing side by side, see and hear exactly the same thing. My personality traits and my wiring, that interprets it differently to the person next to me. But you've got to embrace that. You've got to work with it and make it work for you. And understand those experiences from our past, they mould our present, okay? What's happened there brings us to where we are. How do we become more mindful and more present in our ability to do this right now? And as I said for you at the very start, turning up today is a big step. Because we all have an excuse not to be here. But being present and mindful of the fact of what we're going to contribute to ourselves, our own little community, allows us to move forward. And living by those values, understand the values you live by, which creates a reflection ability to make sure that your behaviours and your activities and your outcomes are anchored to a point. And if you keep delivering on your value to yourself, we keep moving forward in a positive way. <coughs> With that, it's a little exercise. You're going to split yourselves up into table. And you've got two groups per table, so there's about three to four per table. Blue pieces of paper on your table. One piece of paper per group. And per group, what I'm going to get you to do, please, is... I'm going to get you to build a paper aeroplane. But what I'm actually going to get you to do is do this. I'm going to get you to do this in silence. So person by person, you are going to have a fold. Person by person, you're going to let that person have a fold. You are not going to tell them what to do because everybody in here <coughs> believes they are a perfect paper aeroplane engineer. Some of you would just like to be the hostie. <laughs> so turn by turn, I want to get you to build a paper aeroplane without talking, without communicating. I want to see how you go, see how you feel. You can't unfold somebody else's fold. Let's go. You've got two minutes. Get it done. <laughs> All right, once your group has done that, please, one pilot from each group, come towards the front, please. <laughs> Stand this way. We're gonna go. Pilot. Cool. In a line. Hold on. Go one by one. Go really quick. All right. So once we've got all those pilots, we're gonna get through this quickly. Okie dokie. Beautiful. All right. Firstly, how do we feel? We're not talking. How did we feel? A bit like. Ah, I need to talk. Okay, firstly, it's a competition. Everyone's got a beautifully engineered, some look like a UFO, some look like perfect fighter jets. That's your target. Five years I've been doing this, one person's ever hit it. Go. Oh, oh, boom, thanks. Next, boom. 
Oh. <laughs> Next. Okay, go. <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, like past the table would be cool. Oh, started off so well. Go. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Oh, well done. You hit the board. That's a win. That's not a win. <laughs> oh, well, well done. Close. Go. Next. <laughs> there you go. Oh. That group can get another pilot. Next. Oh. So close, yet so far. Someone, you just hit someone on the beach. <laughs> Here we go. Oh, so, oh, they're done. Perfect. Old recyclable aeroplanes. Done. Thanks very much. Cool. Oh, so close. Yet so close. You hit the board. That's a win. All right. Okay. Let's bring that back. What did we learn? What did we learn from that? And uh, what do we learn? What do we learn about actually building a paper aeroplane while not talking? Everybody has different ways of doing things. Perfect. Embracing your difference. Everybody's got a different way of doing it. But owning the way you do it is what we're about. What about the talking thing, the no talking? What about if I had asked you or allowed you to talk while you're doing it, what do you think the voice would have been? Telling someone how to do it. Telling somebody how to do it. So when we talk about with the mental health in our terms of our journey, when we talk to people, when you tell somebody that they need help, you tell them what they should do, will they do it? No. You allow that space for those people to process it in their way so they accept that help. And I had a lot when we do this at schools. It's amazing when you do it at schools because kids are like, ah! But you do it the same thing. We get them to do it without the voice and then do, do it with the voice. And it goes off. What happens when you get four voices in your head? What does it create? Confusion. That's what anxiety is. Anxiety is your brain's confusion and its ability to process. And the idea of the paper aeroplane is that, as I said, we all think we're all engineers and perfectly, it looks amazing. I've got one person, or maybe two people, I think two people in this whole room hit even the board. So what's that mean? Our perfect plans don't always go perfectly in execution. We all have the idea of where we want to get to, but allowing yourself to go, okay, it's not always going to work out for me, but how do I evolve with it? How do I become aware of it? How do I regulate it? How do I acknowledge the fact of what I can do better? Or how do I improve it next time? Simple exercise. You can do that with your group back at your workplace. Ask them how do they do that. Then there's acknowledgement. Okay, acknowledgement, this is how I'm feeling. I'm aware of it here. But what am I going to do with it? As I said, that processing place. Talk, talk, talk. How do I process that information? How do I engage the experience here to move forward? And the biggest part of that is our relationships. The importance of connection, the purpose, the support, and the meaning of our relationships. And not every relationship is a positive one. The most positive relationship you need to have is with who? Yourself. You need to be making sure that I'm aware of my relationship with myself to make sure I'm, me, getting the best out of my every minute. Not leaving stuff for tomorrow. How do I engage and invest in those relationships to make sure that I do feel safe enough and supported so no matter if I write down my 
notes, my story in my notes, that I can give it to the person next to me and not have that feeling of, oh. So with that, I'm gonna ask you to bring your phone out again, please. I'm gonna ask you to write down the five names, the five individual names of the people in your life that are in your crew. Who's in your support crew? Who are the five people that you know you can rely on no matter what the situation is? Goods, bads and indifference, the holy shit moments, all them. Thanks. Five individual names. Myself, my wife, my mum, my sister, guy I work with, Jimmy, and one of my good mates for a long time, Matt Pilios. If you don't know who Matt Pilios is, you'd be surprised because everyone knows who Matt Pilios is. No. Write down those five names. So what I'm going to get you to do with those five names, I'm actually going to get you to actually contact those people. Not right now, but when you leave here, hopefully it's based over the weekend, because you should have plenty of time, because time is our precious, most precious gift. And I want you to acknowledge to those people that they're in your crew, they're in your support network, and I want you to tell them what they mean to you. What they mean. As I said, what I said up before about the relationships, is the meaning. Find the meaning of those relationships because you acknowledging to those people allows them to also think that they are being acknowledged. And as a human, in this society, to contribute to our community, we need to feel acknowledged. So I want you to contribute and ask those people, but not just leave it there and tell them, oh yeah, great, you're in my crew. <laughs> the big part around how we talk about those relationships and conversations is how do we normalise the behaviour around that conversation? How do we normalise the behaviour about talking about our challenges and owning our story? So consistently checking in with those people, whether it be a text message, a phone call, preferably face to face, Checking in on a consistent basis allows us to process the fact that when we do need help, we know what's there. We know our crew's there for us. Because if we make an event out of asking for help, are you going to turn up? Most likely not. So take away that doubt. Take away that little speed hump. And consistently check in with these people. Just ask them how they're going. The problem that we have in Australia is that it's become a culture that we say, hey, you're going, as a greeting. Hey, there you go. Boom, see you later. <laughs> the idea of, the idea, you say, hey, you're going, and you think you can read it, and the person's about to go, oh, I'm not good, and you're like, good on ya. <laughs> we do. But how do you engage that body language? Make sure that person feels safe enough in that conversation, that environment, that connection I talked about before here, to make sure that we can talk about it so we do turn up that, to that. As I said, don't make an event out of it, make it a normal behaviour. Uh, so we just talk about stress, okay? There's a whole range of different things about stress. Stress is actually related to 99% of illnesses, okay? So there's different forms of, um, physical signs of stress as you can read up there, okay? Chest pain, fatigues, nausea, <coughs> you know, your immune system goes down, the excessive sweating, appetite, whatever it is, okay? We'll interpret the, the physical signs of stress differently. It all reacts to us differently, okay? And there's a non-physical signs of stress. There's those feelings, the overwhelmed feeling. And it's not just the physical component or the emotional, there's a whole range of things that are part of our life. We talk about those normal stresses of life, socially, workplace, family, finance, all different stresses and how it impacts us, okay, and what we can do with it, but how you interpret it and acknowledge what those stresses are and how it works for you to make sure that you can move forward, okay. Understanding stress, as I said, people will shy away from stress, but owning the stress allows you to play the victor. 
If you take the stress in and don't process and filter it, like up there, bop. It's not gonna work for you. Because stress allows us to grow. Our interpretation of stress and how we combat the stress allows us to grow, physically and emotionally. And there's different ways, everyone, you'll have different ways of doing it, okay? How you manage that stress, especially in your workplace. And as much as we all believe that we work in the most amazing workplaces, <laughs> there's some people in that workplace and interpreting, interpreting that experience a lot differently. So how do you make sure that we as a community in your workplace are creating a safe enough and supportive enough environment to make sure that we're all flourishing? That we're all flourishing, not just me, all of us. That's culture, and culture's king. But don't just leave it at the workplace, take it home, take it wherever you are. Create that environment. So self-care, right, this is our action part. And this will go into our mental health strategy, okay? What I would like you to do is understand, just think about the fact, can we get those other ones? Yeah. Tripping over paper aeroplanes that nobody <laughs> made the distance on. <laughs> Creating a more holistic approach to your self-care is the way we lift everyone up. If I invest all my energies and my actions into one part of my life, and that one part of my life doesn't go quite so well, or hits a little hurdle, how do I feel? How do you feel? Like shit? Yeah? You can. So with this, we talk about understanding, so I'm aware of it, I acknowledge it, then I need to get it done. Keep evolving and keep practicing. Keep investing and keep making it work. Lay the foundations, as it said, self-care, holistically valued, lays the foundations so that we can cope with those normal stresses of life. Putting yourself into a position, as you said, on here, on your sheets, when you go away from here, I'd like you to write down the different components, the different investments, the different activities, behaviours that you do to create your self-care. And we do break it up into six domains. Okay, so physical, emotional, social, vocational, self, and our intellectual capabilities. Okay? Write down and allow yourself to reflect more regularly and consistently normalise the behaviours around it. So small gestures that create big wins in our life. The small gestures. They make big events out of everything. The more small gestures that we do, the more small activities, the more small steps, because the way to get from here to there is to take the first step. Then you take the next step, next step, next step. Keep filtering, keep reflecting, keep investing. So for myself, my typical day, I wake up at four o'clock every morning. I go to the gym, I meditate for about 15 to 20 minutes and then I exercise for about an hour and a half because it works for me. I'm currently training for a big 350 kilometre bike ride. So for those people that ride bikes, you understand the awkwardness of having a conversation with somebody else wearing Lycra. <laughs> but embrace it and own it. I've been training for that, then I go home and before I get out of the car, to go have breakfast with my two boys, my four-year-old and my nearly two-year-old, I sit in the car and I meditate for another five minutes. Disconnect or reconnect. The practice of meditation and being mindful is your ability to disconnect, to reconnect. It's not to shut everything out, it's just to slow everything down. Because our head, like that all the time. Pull yourself back, process it down. And be mindful, as I said, if you, every moment. In your workplace, if you feel in a stressful position, same thing I'll do. I'll go through the same stresses as everybody else. Sit back from my desk, 60 seconds, shut my eyes down, turn the computer away, bring back my breathing, then get back into it. 
your performance, I guarantee you, will improve. But you've got to disconnect and reconnect. I have my breakfast, I get ready. I never get changed before breakfast time with the boys because I did that and I learned from that because one time I was going to speak at a presentation, I had a suit on and I got a smoothie thrown at me by my two-year-old. <laughs> so you got to learn from your experiences. Do that, go to my workplace. And before, I, same thing, before I go into my, my office, I sit there, just 60 seconds. Car off, music off, breathe, then make my way through. I don't work till 10 o'clock at night. I make sure I get my time for my family because the most important thing about my connection to my reason why is my family. Same as you. Find your reason why and what's going to work for you. And before I go to bed, same thing. TV off, sit in the room, couch, chill out, bang, breathing, think about what my day, or what my beautiful day was. Is every day a good day? Yes, even with the shit. Because every day is a good day because you're still alive. You gotta embrace that shit. Make sure that you make sure you improve on it tomorrow with the small gestures. And so some of my self cares, sleep routine. What do we sleep? Apart from being tired. What do we sleep? What's the number one? Reason why our body needs sleep. Recharge. Recharge. You are like a phone. You don't run yourself flat. You don't run your phone flat. As soon as you do, you don't perform properly. So you recharge. The only sensory activity in our body that switches off when you're asleep is your eyes. And the reason why our eyes shut off is because so our brain can tell the difference between living and a dream. But if you process yourself right and your filter's a bit cleaner, and your sleep routine is down, you're going to wake up thinking, I'm good. If you go to bed stressed, you're going to wake up so tired because you haven't shut off. A whole range of other things exercise, good journals, relationships. And I said, meditation for me is a big one, but different ways of doing it. Okay. And where can this lead you? As we'll finish around. Anywhere you want to. If you invest in yourself, you can go anywhere you want to. I was told in my own head, by myself, for so long, that I'd never be anywhere. I was told by teachers, clearly, because that's what they do to the kid that's a bit challenging. You'll never get anywhere. And then I got drafted and they were all my friends, weren't they? <laughs> Don't worry about what other people tell you. You gotta tell yourself. If I wanna get there, this is what I'm gonna do for myself to get there. We're gonna go through some hurdles, you're gonna have to jump over some walls. That's fine. It's all worth it in the end. And never let anybody tell you you can't be happy or healthy. All right? It's a quote that I found. So when I got the, finally got the help that I needed, the conversation I had with my wife the day after, 24 hours after, I nearly suicided. Finally actually allowed myself to clean my filter. She asked me three times how I was going. Am I all right? It's so the first time she said, how are you going? You all right? What does everybody say when they ask that question? I'm fine. Fine is the real F word. She asked me again. Same thing. I'm good. Leave it alone. She asked me again. Once she asked me again, she asked me with evidence. She noted to me to the fact that I look like shit. And I still married her. Yeah. But she did. You're all right. You look like crap. You haven't been yourself lately, what's up? <coughs> that allowed me to feel acknowledged of what I was going through. The first time someone ever really genuinely with body language made me feel safe enough to talk about my crap. And I did. I it, put it through, got the help that I needed. Went and saw three psychologists before I actually connected to a psychiatrist 
that I felt safe enough and supported enough to actually own my shit. And I did. Did that, soul searching that all went through. The recovery went clean on the drugs. Anyway, questions? Oh, cool. Yeah, am I okay? But please, yes. Sorry, you mentioned you got kids. Yeah. I'll be interested in like, how do you um, help them in their progression of their sort of mental health? Oh, jeez. Good question. Um, we, 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 we live by honesty now, uh, having those honest, open conversations. And I've told my um, four year old that daddy was sad for a long time. You know, and that's how I explained it to him, um, that I did enjoy what I was doing for a long time. And we sort of just tried to instill those values around him, acknowledging to the fact. That, and my, my young one has, um, my four year old has some emotional challenges at, at this stage, he has some emotional processing challenges at this stage. So he's now getting help. We, we, my my uh, four year old sees a, a counsellor, he's in a, in a group thing talking about emotional intelligence and talk about his colour zones and all that sort of stuff. And, it's just helping them understand, like, hey, this is our journey, this is what we're doing. Make sure you just enjoy every bit of what you're doing. <coughs> understand that there's going to be some hurdles, but owning it. So we ask him, just, just openly ask him. These are my kids, I openly ask him. The, the, the hardest question <coughs> I've been asked about that is, will I tell my kids about drugs? Have to. Because if I don't, I'm not being honest. But I also talk 300 times a year, <laughs> sharing my story and my, it's public knowledge. It's on Wikipedia that I was a drug addict. <laughs> I don't think so, but probably is. <laughs> but it's about instilling those behaviours and making sure, as I said, creating the different environments for them. So my, and the biggest, my wife hates it. Because I played footy, the number one question people ask us is, oh, are your kids going to play footy? Who cares? They'll do what they want to do. If they want to do it and they're happy doing it, good. Keep trying things. Keep practicing, keep evolving, keep investing in different things. That's, for, that's what, hopefully. And, and we, as I said, we sell a big game of hope. <laughs> the world's about a big game of hope. Hopefully it works. Don't get me wrong, I come from a super unbelievably strong family of values. My parents are most amazing, hardworking people I, I know in my life. So the values that we had as, as growing up, the opportunities that we had, and I still went through the shit. My dad still went through the shit. My mum goes through shit. My sister, my brother. We all go through challenges, we all go through battles, but as I said, trying to create a more supportive and safe environment to make sure that we feel like we're acknowledged and we belong. And the problem we're having in society is that people have become so entitled this, this, this sense of entitlement allows the, it, 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 people start to believe that they feel like they are, have the right to judge. Don't judge me. Don't judge me. Don't judge how I go about it. Keep your opinion to yourself. Because I'm doing this for me. This is my life. I'm living myself 24-7. You've got to live with yourself 24-7. As soon as we start passing judgment to other people, you need to start looking at yourself. You need to start, bang. And if you can honestly eyeball yourself in the mirror every single day and have those honest, bold conversations with yourself every single day and not take your eyes off you, perfect. But if you take your eyes off you, we've got some work to do. But don't place judgment on other people. And this is the biggest hurdle we're facing in the mental health system in our community is that as soon as you pass judgment, you label people. You're putting labels on people, <coughs> pulls people back. And the majority of people, when they say one in two people in their lifetime will be diagnosed with mental illness, 100% of us go through mental health challenges. So don't label me, make it work for us. Anybody else? Yes? You spoke a lot about um, the different culture in the AFL and the league sport and getting play. What yeah. do you think it's improved and what areas can they improve better? Just the same in society, mate. It's the same thing in society. The, the, awareness, is, the, the awareness of mental health is done. 
Okay, everyone's aware of it. Let's get it done. The Royal Commission now, same thing to the sports clubs, into workplaces, into schools. We'll start with schools. Schools, do, some do it good, some don't do it so well. Placing an importance on it. Same thing in the workplace. Workplaces are placing an importance on the fact of our people, and investing in our people allows us to have our people. Because you don't invest, you don't have your people, you don't have us. Yeah? So same thing in a sports club. In, when I was playing, we had a one, we'll call him a welfare person, part-time, was like just a guy. Yeah? Now, the clubs that do it well, professional sports that do it well, workplaces that do it well, have a well-being team <laughs> that champion the cause for their people. 20 years ago, you wouldn't have had a general manager of people, would you? So this is what it's about. We're all investing, we're all making sure we're aware of it. We're <coughs> allocating resources now to make sure that we have our people. Invest the time and efforts. Employee assistance programs support the services are available. The issue that we're also having around the hospital system is that the hospital system for people that, it should be for people that are medium to high risk, yeah? but it's been clogged up from the fact of people in the low risk stages of mental health challenges. That is still highly important because that's the most important thing that's going on in their life, most definitely. But what we as ever try to do is promote the self-care activities, supportive community aspect of what we can do and access first before it gets and escalates to that position. Because people in our life, in our community, go from hero to zero like that, yeah? But it's as I said, laying those foundations around the tools and strategies, making sure my self-care, that I can cope with those normal stresses so I don't go from hero to zero, I'll just go from hero to a degrade sled. Yeah? That's cool. Anybody else? Yes? Um, if you've got a friend or a family member who are going through some mental health challenges, yes. Yep, you should have. <coughs> Top tips, those ones, yeah. So the, ch the check-in one is, is really important, mm -hmm. most definitely. Um, did you get that? Top tips one? Yeah. In the middle, in the middle of your table, there's a big, that's all right, oh cool, perfect, yeah. All right, um, checking in. Checking in is a big one, yeah, to making sure that there's a, there's a normally consistent behavior around that. Everybody got a copy of that sheet? Yeah, take forward. Um, there's a whole lot of, obviously, online resources. I love me, love you. We have, uh, have counsellors that work in to make sure you can help navigate the mental health system. And the mental health system I'm talking about is having those conversations, what to say, how to say it. Making sure that they feel, don't just say, oh, are you OK now? And then walk away. Ask them what they want to do with that information, how you process that information for them. Um, Sharing, as I said, sharing your own story. We all go through challenges. But don't, if someone's sharing their story, don't just jump in with, oh, this is how I felt. Because they don't feel like acknowledged, okay? Never make it about you. It's always about that person that you're helping or supporting, okay? So never make it about you, definitely make it about you. Biggest tip I can ever give you about actually accessing and having that conversation you never go to somebody you're going to ask for help or they're going all right with your phone. Why? You get distracted. Your body language, your brain is already distracted by holding your phone. Because as soon as a vibration, a notification or a message or email or text message or phone call comes, bang, you've taken away that and that connection between here is lost. So never take your phone to that conversation. Yeah, that's a big one. All right. But always ask them what do they want to do with that information. You've got to, you, you actually got to respect the privacy and confidentiality of that conversation as well. Because never just go, oh, I've had this conversation here, Lisa. I'm going to go tell somebody else. Ask them what they want to do with it and they can share it and they can help you through that position. Yeah. Um, and so there's an amazing amount of resources and information come through there. 
the mental health system, as I said, is getting re is really backed up in terms of the high risk stages. Um, but as I said, as a community, we need to be able to contribute and check in and make sure that we have the safe enough environment to understand the challenges, whether there's something like this or like this. Yeah? Cool? Yeah? And big congratulations to you all once again for turning up and for your attention. Thanks very much and cheers. Ciao.